My name is Sister Claire. I'm from Ireland, from the north, um, from a wee town called Derry. I'm from a Catholic family. Um, I grew up Catholic. My parents are Catholic. My whole family is Catholic. Ever since I was little, I don't know why, but I always had this desire to be, um, to be famous, to, to be successful. Um, when I was 14, I started off in an acting agency where I have my own manager. Um, when I was 16, I was a presenter on the television. And um, I studied theater, I wrote theater, uh, I directed. And when I was um, 17, I started drinking. And I liked to party, I smoked, all that kind of stuff. And one time, one of my friends, her name was Sharon, she called me up and she said, Claire, do you want to go to Spain? Because uh, there was this free trip to Spain. And she told me that there was going to be uh, a group of people that were going, and that's all that she told me. She said, all the people that are going to go to Spain are going to meet up in this house next week. Can you just understand me when you say She said, all the people who are going to go to Spain are going to meet up in this house next week. So um, I said that I would go, that I was going to go to Spain, and I thought we were going to go to Spain to party. That's what I thought. I thought we were going to go to a place called Ibiza. She didn't say that to me, but that's what I thought in my head. That we were going to go there, we were going to party, we were going to drink, all that kind of stuff, for 10 days. So um, the week passed, and uh, I went to the this house that she told me to go to, and there was this man who was about 50 years old, and he opened the door, and I said, is this the house where everybody's going to Spain? They're, they're meeting up on here, right? And he said, yeah, come on in. So he took me into his um, living room, he opened the door, and there was this group of people, and about 20, 30 people, they were 40, 50, 60 years old, all sitting there with rosaries. <laughs> He's all going to Spain and say, Yeah, we're going to the pilgrimage. I said, You're going to what? And I go to the pilgrimage. Now, my friend Sharon was sitting over there in the corner and she said, I forgot, I, it's a pilgrimage. It's a pilgrimage. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, so, yeah, it was a pilgrimage. Um, five days in a 16th century monastery. Not exactly what I had imagined. Um, so, it was going to be a pilgrimage. Uh, Five days was going to be in, in this 16th century monastery in Prelo in Spain with the home of the mother. So I said, I can't go. I said, I don't, I don't know how to pray. I can't go to. And she said, Well, your name's in the ticket. If you don't go, we're going to lose seven hundred dollars or something like that. So you have to go. So, um, so I went. Now it's funny because this friend of mine, Sharon, the one who was like, You have to go. You have to go. The day before we got on the bus to go to the airport in Belfast to get to Spain, her appendix busted. So um, she couldn't go on the pilgrimage. So I remember sitting in the bus in the back seat and she was like, bye! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, her appendix busted. Um, so then I arrived in Spain and um, it was during this Holy Week, and I was telling this to the girls in my group, that I lived that Holy Week very badly. Um, I was a terrible smoker, and um, I was always outside trying to um, to sunbathe, you know, or to and, and smoke. And while the talks were going on, for example, the talks that they gave this morning and yesterday, while those talks were going on, I would be outside smoking cigarettes and, and looking at the vultures. Um, and then we would have group discussion, and I remember the very first uh, group discussion, they were talking about the Eucharist, and I was 17 years old, and I didn't even know what that was, and I remember the views of this Eucharist were a lot nicer, what are they talking about? Um, no one had ever told me either that our Lord had died for me, no one had told me that, you know, I was used to going to my granny's house and seeing a cross on the wall, but that, it didn't mean anything to me. So Good Friday came, a day like today, and this was a big grace that our Lord gave me um, nearly eight years ago. And I was sitting at the back bench of the of the church in Prevo, and I saw that everybody was, well, first of all, I wasn't even going to go to this. I don't even think I went to Master in the Holy Week. And um, they said, Claire, you have to go. Today's Good Friday. Our Lord died for us. You have to go. So I went in. I said, fine. I sat on the, I sat on the back bench of the church. And he said, Claire, you have to get up and kiss the cross. You know, everybody's doing it. Get up. I said, I'm kissing the cross. Get up, Claire, you gotta kiss the cross. So I got up because everybody else was doing it. And I remember standing in line waiting to kiss the cross. It didn't mean anything to me. Um, but I did not know what our Lord had prepared for me when I um, went up to kiss that cross. I remember when I went up there. And just imagine the attitude that I have, and I tell you this so that you can see the mercy of God and how he looks on us 
um, with great compassion that when I went up there to kiss that cross, I remember looking at it, and this was about five seconds, I'm telling you, it wasn't a long time, but when I looked at our Lord's hands on the cross, um, I saw that for every sin that I had committed, it was, it nailed him to the cross. And this was something that, that moved me um, in a way that I, I can't even, can even explain to you. But I remember going back to my seat and I, I was crying and crying. And what was going through my head at that moment was, I killed God. That's what I was thinking. I killed God. And um, feeling the weight of that, that I had killed God, I felt at the same time that he said, but I forgive you. I suppose you've had this experience as well, that when you're here in Holy Week, or when you're on a retreat and when you're with people, it's easy to say to God, whatever you want, you know, five hours of adoration, five, I'll give you six hours of adoration, and, you know, and you say things like that to God when you're with a lot of people and you're feeling all this lovey-dovey stuff, but, um, so I said to our Lord, I said, you know what, I said, ask me whatever you want, I'll give you whatever you ask of me and all that, but, um, after that Holy Week encounter, I had to go back to the big bad world with all my friends, with all my environment, and, um, I saw that it wasn't so easy to say to our Lord, I'll give you whatever you, you want, because um, I had a lot of friends, I was drinking a lot, you know, I had a boyfriend, I had um, I had a career, I had a manager, I was going to be famous, I was going to be famous, you know, I couldn't think about what um, God was asking me to do, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, Father Raphael, he's our founder, he invited me to go to um, a pilgrimage to Italy. I was 17. I went, I was very superficial, very um, outward, you know, um, superficial. You know what that means, right? That's my father probably explained that very well this morning. Um, so um, I remember I was sitting in the bus in Italy. We were traveling around. Um, we were going to go and see the Pope there. And they would take us to see different places where there was, you know, there was a saint's finger or, you know, there was a saint's body and stuff that happened. While everyone would go and visit all that kind of stuff, and they would go to the Vatican and all, I would be sitting um, at a bar with some of the girls from the pilgrimage, and not taking advantage whatsoever of the pilgrimage of the graces that our Lord could have given me. Uh, nevertheless, our Lord once again um, looked at me with great pity, and He said to me, Claire, I want you to live like one of the sisters. I want you to live in poverty, chastity, and obedience. I think it was that moment that my eyes started twitching like that. <laughs> I was going for the whole um, wealth, fame, and beauty uh, situation, and our Lord was asking me the total opposite. And I said, Lord, I can't do that. I can't. I can't be poor. I can't be... And I was giving them all these these reasons that I, I couldn't live like a sister. I couldn't do that. That it was impossible. I was going to be famous. God, did you not know I was going to be famous? Um, I remember. <laughs> God, did you not know? Um, but I, I remember our Lord saying to me, if I ask you to do this, I'll give you the strength and the grace to be able to do it. So I went back home to Ireland, and it was during that year that, um, that I started drinking more and more, and I would get myself into states when I would, um, um, we would go out every weekend, which would then turn into getting drunk every day, um, where, you know, people would have to take me out of the bar and, um, take me home because I couldn't do it by myself. But there was this one night that I was sitting in um, in the bathroom because what would usually happen was I'd, I'd drink so much that I'd end up vomiting at the end of the night. So I remember one night I was sitting in uh, in a bathroom and there was three toilet cubicles and I was sitting in the middle one and I was looking down at the ground because I was gonna I was gonna be sick. And all of a sudden I felt that there was something looking at me. And I remember looking up because I thought there was someone at the other toilet cubicle sat on top of the toilet looking over at us. And I looked over and there was nothing there. And I looked at the other side, there was nothing there. But there was something there looking at me. I'll tell you right now that it's like, if I close my eyes, I know that you're looking at me. Well, that's the same experience that I had in that toilet cubicle. <laughs> um, <laughs> our Lord works however he wants, so I'm telling you. I felt that there was something looking at me, and in my soul, I heard these words, why do you keep hurting me? And I knew it was God that was talking to me, I knew it was God. I started to cry and cry, and not only that time, but other times when I was with my friends and we would be sitting at the bar or whatever, um, I'd feel this look, and I'd feel the same words within me, why do you keep hurting me? That year I got um, a part, I, I broke with my manager because I thought that I could do it all by myself. 
I was offered a part in a, in, a, in a movie, and to do that I had to fly to England. Now when you work in the television, or um, you're, you're presenting programs or acting or whatever, or if you have a small part in a movie like I did, you have this lady that's always running around behind you, you know, opening the doors, putting on your makeup, doing your hair, you've got all this kind of stuff. And at night usually what you do is you go out and you eat with the, the actors and the directors and stuff like that. They put you up in this big hotel room, they give you whatever you want. And I remember the first few nights I would go out eating with the directors and the actors, and there was this one night I said, I'm going to go back to my hotel room. And I went back there, and I remember sitting at the top of the hotel bed, and I was looking at the schedule I had for the next day that said that the show would come pick me up and take me to set and all that. Now, I remember looking at that piece of paper, and I started crying and crying and crying. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I pray to God that He gives you the grace to feel um, a total emptiness when you try and fill yourself with things that are not hidden. Um, they can be objects, they can be people, they can be your own desires. But I'll tell you that when you do that and you try and fill your soul with all that stuff, it only leaves you um, very unhappy. And I remember crying and I couldn't stop for hours and hours and hours, crying and crying. I was thinking to myself, why am I crying? Why are you crying, Claire? You know what? You've got everything. You've got... I knew that by doing this part of the movie, I was friends with the casting director who later called me when I was in Spain, that, that I could, you know, go up this ladder of success, that I was going to get more parts. I knew that. But I felt that I had, I had achieved everything, and at the same time, I had nothing. I had nothing within me. I knew that I had to change my life. I knew that I had to cut with, with everything that was taken away from God. And that's easier said than done, you know. I would, I would say with a cigarette in this hand and a beer in the other. So guess what? I'm, I'm going to be a nun. You can imagine why people would laugh. My poor mother, you know, she'd look at me and say, what am I rearing? Because I would say, I know. Um, but um, I didn't have a very, uh, what's that word? Um, what? Coherent. I didn't live a very coherent life, but um, our Lord, nevertheless, He He saw what I He saw what I was, and He never once um, said, "You know what? I, I think I made a mistake with that girl." You know. The more I lived um, incoherently, is that right? Uh, the more that He seemed to to call me, um, and so I, I saw that our Lord called me to leave everything, and with His His strength and His grace. And with the intercession and the help of our Holy Mother, I was able to do that. And so um, I left everything, which in reality for me now is nothing, um, to follow Him. And so I entered with the sisters uh, seven years ago. And here I am, ladies and gentlemen.